conference um, and turn to three of the most distinguished ambassadors in Washington uh, representing uh, their countries. Um, we were um, uh, back in the green room and enjoying lunch and the, <coughs> the uh, uh, happy and uplifting tone of these three gentlemen uh, belied the somewhat pessimistic economic and security forecasting we did in the morning, so I'm hoping we'll end on a, uh, on a somewhat upbeat note. Um, uh, to my immediate left is the Honorable Nguyen Quoc Quang, the ambassador from the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. Uh, he arrived in Washington as ambassador in 2011, and before that served as a deputy minister in the foreign ministry and uh, deputy prime minister responsible for foreign affairs. Um, Ashok Kumar Mirpuri is the ambassador from Singapore uh, since 2012. He was ambassador in Indonesia and high commissioner in Malaysia and Australia. And Ambassador Kenichiro Sasai is Japan's ambassador to the United States. He served as vice minister uh, in the foreign ministry before coming here. I've known Sasai-san a long time. He's had pretty much every um, difficult job there is in the foreign ministry, <coughs> North Korea, trade, Asian affairs, um, somehow survived. <laughs> and uh, has, has um, uh, risen to vice uh, foreign minister and now ambassador, um, lending a very steady hand on the tiller in our bilateral relationship with Japan. <clears throat> we have uh, an hour. I'm going to ask a few questions of the ambassadors, uh, picking up on some of the discussions and uh, clicker survey results from this morning, and then we'll open it up for some questions before we conclude. I wanted to start um, uh, by asking about President Obama's trip to Asia uh, this spring. Um, he, uh, or the White House, has not formally announced the itinerary. The expectation is he will uh, visit Japan. Um, uh, and there's talk also of Malaysia and the Philippines, possibly Indonesia. Um, but the entire region will be watching the trip. Um, and I wanted to ask each of the ambassadors um, what, they, uh, what they would like to see. What are, what are the expectations for you uh, you th for the region as you see it, for the President's visit. We asked the audience what they expected from the trip, and um, the highest hope and expectation seemed to be that TPP would move forward, but uh, some people said uh, improving relations with China, some people said consolidating relations with other countries. <clears throat> um, I think it was Chris Johnson or Victor Shaw who said actually it's all of the above. Um, so what would you like to see come out of the President's trip? Um, if uh, we could, we'll start on that side uh, and then work our way down. Ambassador? Well, thank you, Michael. Um, uh, thank you for giving opportunity for me uh, to address the, uh, this, uh, this gathering. Uh, about uh, President Obama's visit to the region, I think it is vital opportunity for the United States to uh, express its vision, what role the United States is going to play. And we know all this pivoting, Americans uh, rebalancing and so forth. He need to operationalize. He need to substantiate what he means by that. And, and for that, we continue to have a great expectation for the United States to show its interest, its commitment, and um, its role, specific, what it's going to do for the uh, regional peace and stability. And that, that is what uh, most of the countries and regions are welcoming. And, and saying that, uh, we also want to see the United States make clear who are the friends and allies and trouble makers and potential uh, problem makers. And uh, you need to uh, make sure that the United States is going to play the vital role. So you have to have your own allies and friends with you very strongly. I think that's very important thing for the United States to do. Now, and also, uh, obviously, there are some challenges. Security challenges like uh, nuclear challenges, maritime challenges, and, and, and also human rights and democracy challenges on all around in the region. So there are lots of changes taking place. So what we need to see that America will continue to work for that one together with friends and allies. Now on the economic side, I think we need to get the TPP done before the president will come. Thank you. 
Um, I'll, I'll follow up on that in a moment, but thank you. Um, Ashok? Thank you, Mike. I can agree with everything that the Japanese ambassador says, but I think it's important to see the visit not as a discrete event. It has to be seen in the overall context of the U.S. engagement with the Asia-Pacific, which is not something that is new, despite all the talk of the pivot when the Obama administration came in in 2009. This is something that is ongoing and long-term. You were involved in this, Mike, uh, in the previous White House. It's an ongoing process. So I wouldn't put all the elements and saying this is going to be the make or break visit. It's, we have to see it in the context of what else has to be done. The president goes presumably in spring. He would go again in November for the East Asia Summit. He missed last year's East Asia Summit. So he will get out there again. And this is an ongoing continuing engagement. What, what is, I think, useful in terms of addressing it uh, looking ahead into the year, we have had the pivot for five years. People don't like the term, I don't like the term, but just for a short form, let's call that pivot. And that was pivot 1.0. I think now it's time for pivot 2.0. Sort of relook at what has been achieved in the past five years, where the, some of the gaps are, where some of the uncertainties are, and then move into pivot 2.0. Now that has got a large security dimension, but one of the criticisms of that pivot 1.0 was really, it was a lot of it was security focus. So build on that, but then also look at the economic parts of it. The TPP obviously is very important. And then there are things to be done even with countries that are not TPP members. If he's going to Philippines, Philippines is not a TPP member. If he's going to Indonesia, Indonesia is not a TPP member. What do you do with ASEAN countries who are not in the TPP? Giving them a bridge into the TPP. Let's not put every Singapore, Vietnam, Japan, we're all members of the TPP. While that is important, I think other forms of engagement are important. Energy is very, very critical. Climate change, these are issues of great interest for the region. I think these are things that the president can go and say as part of Pivot 2.0. But it's, again, not everything around the president. Cabinet secretaries have to travel out to the region. Members of the administration have to travel out to the region. You cannot just put all the issues and the burden on the president going out in April and solving these issues, you've, it's got to be a huge run-up of events taking place into that process. And so let's think about it in terms of a pivot 2.0. Thank you. Yes, so first I also agree with what Ambassador Sassin Mipuri from uh, Japan and uh, Singapore just mentioned. I think that uh, the president's visit to the region is very, very important. I noticed that last night uh, when uh, he, uh, President Obama delivered the State of the Union address, he uh, reiterated that the United States will continue to focus on the Asia Pacific. And I, th I think that's a very important point. And uh, <clears throat> apart from the bilateral agenda of the visits, I think that uh, I agree with uh, my colleagues here that uh, you should look at it uh, at a, uh, a regional uh, more uh, geopolitical, uh, strategic you know, uh, uh, points of view. I think at least uh, three or four points. First, it's a continued commitment to rebalancing. And second, it's also a continued commitment to U.S. allies and partners. And uh, third, it's uh, also a co regional com uh, a continued commitment to, to regional architectures. I think that uh, the U.S. Uh, has a very important role in the uh, architecture uh, institution building process in, in, in a South Pacific region, like uh, EAS, APEC, US, ASEAN. Uh, talking about ASEAN, I think that uh, uh, I, would, I would love to see, would love to see US you know, uh, more <coughs> of, uh, focused uh, support on the centrality role of ASEAN and the uh, building and uh, 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 support to the um, uh, building of the ASEAN community by 2015, about the ASEAN connectivity, and uh, so on. And of course, the uh, U.S. has a very important role in, in, um, to play in maintaining peace and security uh, in the region. About economic TPP, I agree with uh, Ambassador Sase from Japan that we would love to see when the president visit uh, the region in April, there would be some big announcement to make on the TPP. We, Vietnam, we also want to conclude the um, work with the United States and other TPP partners to conclude the TPP and the sooner the better. 
Um, thank you. <clears throat> I hope my friends in the NSC are listening to this because these three gentlemen just wrote the president's speech for him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not that you're interfering in our internal affairs. This is uh, much appreciated advice from, from close friends. Um, and a lot of overlap, a lot of consistency. Um, Ambassador Sasai, you emphasize depth a bit. Important to show who are your friends, who are your allies, clarify that. Uh, Ashok, you emphasized um, breadth in some ways. Um, uh, yes, TPP, but also ASEAN and architecture, and as, as did you, Ambassador, in particular, the importance of, of ASEAN. Um, all those elements are somewhere in the U.S. Uh, government's articulation of the rebalance of the pivot. Um, sometimes. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes some are stressed. Sometimes others are stressed. Do you think um, that the region, uh, people following this in your country, uh, understand what the U.S. strategy is? Do they understand what the rebalance is? Or is this trip and the trip at the end of the year going to be really important in terms of um, explaining what the U.S. is about. The, 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 uh, you all made the point that showing up is important. As Woody Allen said, 80% of success in life is just showing up, which was you know, the first talking point in every memo that Matt Goodman and I did in the NSC for our bosses. You gotta show up. And you know, except for missing uh, uh, the trip with the uh, debt crisis, uh, the administration has a pretty good attendance record. Um, but the, the question mark is, does the region understand what the U.S. is trying to achieve? and what our priorities really are. We'll go in reverse order, uh, Ambassador Nguyen, if you don't mind uh, trying to answer that one first. Yes, talking about we are rebalancing, I think that we, uh, the ASEAN and uh, other the uh, regional countries have been talking with the U.S. Uh, administration here uh, uh, again and again that we welcome the U.S. rebalancing. Uh, as long as it uh, contributes to peace, uh, security, and uh, development in the region. And, uh, but uh, we would uh, also uh, uh, want to see a um, uh, balanced, uh, more comprehensive you know, uh, rebalancing. And, uh, and I think that uh, the U.S. is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mipro from Singapore just mentioned, I agree with him, that like uh, one uh, U.S. for the past four or five years is uh, 1.0 uh, uh, rebalancing, and this time is entering the 2.0 uh, rebalancing. I think that uh, with 2.0 uh, rebalancing, we, the countries in the region, want to see the U.S. Uh, we think we, the U.S. can do more about the rebalancing. First, about the U.S. Uh, economic recovery. Everybody is talking about that. And it, in terms of economic uh, recovery in the U.S. Uh, alone, it's also a contribution to to, to, to countries in, in Asia Pacific in, and to the world as, well, as a whole. And I think that, you know, as President Obama mentioned uh, yesterday and, uh, uh, and, and, and the other day is about the, I think, the political gridlock, you know, we don't want to see, you know, the countries in the region, it should be solved, you know, you know in, uh, for, for, for the goods of all. And uh, uh, we also want to see more and more U.S. engagement in economic and trade ties, uh, uh, mentioned about TPP as one, but not all countries in the region are members of TPP. Uh, so I think that e the E3 uh, initiative from US, I think that uh, 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 the United States and other countries in the region should um, put more efforts on, on the E3, for example. And now talking about um, the also other very important issue that uh, few people talk about is about the non-traditional security issues. Uh, I think that's more and more important uh, to the region, uh, like climate change issues, sea level rise for countries like Vietnam and others. So a lot of issues, and uh, that the United States, we want to see the U.S. to get uh, to be more involved. Thank you. Yeah, did, again, I want to take a little bit of the long view of where the U.S. and the role the U.S. has played. I think there is a deep understanding in the region that the U.S. is a resident power, and the U.S. has contributed to peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific for the past 50 or 60 years. And that is something that is, I think, important to keep emphasizing of where the U.S. is. It is very much in the U.S. interest to be active in the Asia-Pacific. And when you ask, does the region understand what this is about, if we look back, 
30, 40, 50 years, the emergence of Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia has really been very much under this umbrella that was provided by the United States. And I think that's what the region wants to see in terms of going forward, that the U.S. setting out what the rules of the game are. The U.S. is the most successful country out in the region over there, playing that role as a resident power. That's what the region wants to see. Unfortunately, with the region, you have to keep reiterating these messages over and over again. It is showing up and it is saying these things over and over again because that's how it gets a much broader understanding. We can discuss these things in, in small meetings, in ASEAN meetings, in EES meetings, but there's got to be a broader articulation of these things. Where the U.S. sees its interests in the Asia-Pacific and what it intends to do in order to protect its interests, that's where I think it, it needs to be explained again and again. Well, thank you. I think I completely agree with Ashoka's point. I think the United States was there, and for many years it is there, and it would be there forever. And, um, but often the case, if there is a misunderstanding, I think that is the time when the United States president doesn't appear and come to the meeting or you know, skipping and so forth, and that gives the impression that the United States is not paying sufficient attention uh, to, to the process in the region. But over the years, I think the United States is increasing its interest in presence. And um, for example, this East Asia Summit, and uh, we were asking the United States to participate some years in not only the APEC and some of the meetings, I think that was a good decision. And uh, nowadays, I think the United States is a major participant to address the security and economic agenda. And that's what we need. And so when we talk about uh, the balancing, uh, we know that uh, whether it is a diplomatic, strategic, economic, security, I think the United States has to be in every part of that process that we are asking for and that what we are expecting the United to do. Now, um, on the um, strategic uh, dimensions, I think the uh, important part of that is uh, United States is engaged in the region and when it, it engages, we continue to see the uh, strength in the alliance networking and not only the, with the allies, but also some of the friendly countries which share the fundamental values like uh, human rights, democracy, and rule of law. That doesn't mean that uh, we have to antagonize those countries which are not really catching up. Look at the example of Burma, say, uh, Myanmar. It was a difficult country for some years. There was a criticism a lot about the democracy and so forth. And, but at the same time, we were engaged with them to advise them to advance little by little, taking some agent span of the time. So on those issues, I think we are moving in the right direction with the support of the United States. When you look at the trend of the region for the democracy, there are some countries that are still lagging behind or even rejecting the idea. But I think the history tells after 10 or 20 years, you know, we are moving in the right direction. I think what the United States can do is to promote the process and continue to say and, and, and does act and continue to uh, be vocal about what the United States believe to be right. Thank you. Um, we've, we've beaten up on the U.S. sufficiently. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, Lee Kuan Yew has the the most painful and accurate line, which is Americans think foreign policy is like a DVD movie. You can turn it on again after you've turned it <laughs> off to go do the dishes. And what I heard was uh, consistency, consistency um, is critical. Um, let's talk about China for a moment. Uh, major, major uh, source of economic growth um, across the region for the United States. Um, but uh, I think uh, our discussion this morning both on the panel and with the audience accurately uh, portrayed the last year as, rough, as a rough one in U.S.-China relations compared to the, the previous years, a uh, rough one for U.S.-Japan. Uh, Vietnam has extremely complicated, long, long history with China. Um, and Singapore, of course, is, uh, well, uh, when you talk about pivoting, I mean, Singapore is right there um, at the fulcrum 
uh, of the Indo-Pacific uh, region. So uh, all your governments are watching this closely. I'm, I'm wondering if we could start uh, perhaps with uh, uh, Ken Sasai. Um, and, and, you know, doing what ambassadors should never do, which is predictions. Um, but ask you, the tone in the audience this morning and on the panel was 2014 might not be a better year necessarily mm. for relations mm. with China. Mm. Uh, is that right? Is that wrong? Well, I think it could be right and wrong both ways. I think it depends. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I mean, it's easy to say that uh, we are destined to be quarreling and fighting and so forth. I don't take that argument. I think people are really afraid that, that all these relationships could be deteriorating. But, uh, you, you know, the, 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 that's not good, to be frank. That's self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, we have to roll back the relationship. I think that's what we want to do. You know, these days, as you are well aware, there are some uh, disputes and bickering, and, uh, and a Chinese ambassador and I have to exchange some, uh, uh, some uh, in a country, in a country op-ed in Washington Post. I mean. That's not a, what I wanted to do, because he's a good friend of mine. He had to do it possibly, and I have to do it. But, uh, you know, uh, we, I have a great, uh, you know, respect and administration to Chinese people. And they have a long history of the development. We have a long history of friendship with them. It's only a limited time of the history. And uh, there is no reason for us to be always bickering and arguing and simply focusing on some, uh, some history, some of the past. Oh, well, we have to always remember the history in the past, but it's not productive to ta only talk about the history and past things and remembering and agitating the people's emotions in a negative way. That's what I want to avoid. So I really hope that um, this year we could go into a very constructive dialogue with China. And uh, although uh, it is not easy all the time uh, to come to a nice dialogue, if you see the history of the dialogue, there is always up and down. While I was vice minister, we, uh, we had a difficulty. And while I was uh, director general, we had the difficulty. But whenever there was a difficulty, there was also effort to regain the momentum of the dialogue. I think that's what we need now. Thank you. Well, as a small country, we are friends with everyone. So that's a good advantage, you know. So we're friends with the US, we're friends with China, we're friends with Japan. I'm pleased to hear the Japanese ambassador <laughs> speak uh, positively about Japan-China relations. And, let me, let me put an ASEAN perspective, you know, because Singapore, we have relationships and with the whole region. For the region, what suits the region is actually calm relationships among the major powers. U.S.-China relations, Japan-China relations, Japan-Korea relations, that's what suits ASEAN. ASEAN is very focused, not the security issues have come into the agenda, but the priority of ASEAN is economic development for the whole region, for the 10 countries of the region. That's what we want to achieve, an ASEAN economic community. And that is not something that we can do on our own. It's something we do with our partners. We have excellent economic relationships with the U.S. The U.S. has been a major investor in most of the Southeast Asian countries and will continue to be. China is a new emerging economic partner for all of us. They have come up with ideas to link the region together. We are trying to do these things. Japan has ideas connecting ASEAN, doing ASEAN connectivity. All these requires a certain calm in the region. These are the major powers, and if they can calm down the relationships among themselves, if they can look ahead, I think that's most useful for ASEAN in many ways. And we want to be able then to have a platform where these countries can engage with each other as well. That's the whole reason why ASEAN has been able to be useful, is creating this platform for the major powers to engage with each other. So that's how I see things working out. I'm going to put you on the spot and follow up and ask, uh, in the context of your very elegant um, uh, and uh, uh, visionary view of the need for the big powers to get along, uh, you didn't mention the U.S. in that, uh, or maybe you included the U.S. What is the U.S. role um, in ensuring an environment where the big powers get along? Well, I, you know, the U.S.-China relationship is key in many ways. And how this is shaped through 2014 is going to shape how the other countries Im 
engage with the two major powers. The US-China economic relationship is growing and will continue to grow, and that's important. But how the US plays its role dealing with China is one that establishes that there are certain institutional structures, rules that apply for everybody. And that's how the US can play that role that is always played in the region. So it's about, it's about rules that apply for everyone, not uh, necessarily, if I can um, uh, draw further out your thinking, not necessarily uh, some new bipolar condominium or management of the region by the US and China, but, but a relationship that allows the rules that we all depend on to take, to take root. Is that a fair well, you know, this, this bipolar idea, sort of multi, uh, is, is something that is talked about, but I don't really see it emerging as, as, a, as a reality. It has to be something that in, involves the whole region, the whole East Asia. Thank you. Yes, uh, talking about uh, our, our relationship with China, I think that Mike was, uh, 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 was right when saying that we have uh, traditions of uh, thousands of years of history of relationship with China. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, all countries in the region wants to have a good relationship with China, given its um, you know, uh, a very big role, very important role in the region. You know, and of course, Vietnam is a neighboring country of China, a very big neighbor of Vietnam. So we want to have a good relationship with, with China. I think last year, relations between Vietnam and China uh, have somewhat improved, and uh, we see more and more uh, uh, exchanges of visits at the highest level, and more frequent you know, contacts. Uh, uh, you know that we established the hotlines among the leaders of two countries for years, but never been used. Uh, last year, we started using it twice. Uh, our uh, party chief and uh, President Xi Jinping just had a phone call you know, the other day, and I think that uh, in the uh, coming uh, Lunar New Year, there will be some more uh, exchanges on the phone um, between the leaders of the two countries. And uh, <coughs> we have now have the strategic, uh, comprehensive strategic partnership with China. Uh, China is number one trading partner of Vietnam, and uh, and and. and and, uh, and so on, you know, uh, exchanges at uh, you know, the people to people and all kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, exchanges. But uh, having said that, I, I must say that we still have a very, very, very different views on the, uh, on, the, on the claims on the South China Sea, we call it an East Sea issue. And <clears throat> uh, we, have great, we have expressed our concerns again and again over the Chinese recent you know, uh, uh, activities, uh, acts you know, um, on the South China Sea, like the fishing ban, which you consider it as illegal and uh, it's uh, invalid uh, because it violates our territory, our uh, uh, integrity, and, uh, and, 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 and we call on the Chinese side to revoke it. Uh, maritime security in the Asia-Pacific region is a vital national interest for all three of your countries and for the United States. And as you mentioned, Ambassador, you had the um, recent case of, uh, of a Chinese um, uh, declaration of administrative control over fisheries. You had the uh, air defense identification zone in the East China Sea. Uh, I think many analysts expect at some point similar uh, ADIZ in the South China Sea or the uh, Yellow or West Sea. What, I'm going to ask all three of you, but begin with Ambassador Nguyen, what, what, what's the right toolkit to deal with these maritime problems? Is it, is it the ARF and multilateral? Is it uh, deterrence? Is it dialogue and confidence building? How, for three countries that have a vital national interest in maritime security, how, how uh, should uh, we all be trying to um, deal with these issues, which look like they could complicate 2014 uh, yet again? Yes. <clears throat> I think that uh, the uh, many time claims, conflicting claims among uh, countries in the region is a very complicated issue. We don't expect uh, the, uh, the dispute to be solved overnight. So uh, um, we think the most important thing is no, there's no other way that all countries need to uh, respect international laws. You know? uh, who uh, established norms and rules, and that's number one. Number two, that pending a solution 
all countries should refrain from you know, complicating this division to uh, exercise self-restraint. And uh, in that regard, I think that uh, we see some positive uh, uh, development when uh, for the first time that China and the ASEAN countries have agreed for a some uh, senior officials level uh, consultation, formal consultation on the COC last year, uh, as I recall it uh, last uh, September. But uh, we call for an early, you know, uh, early substantive negotiation on CCC to be started soon. And uh, number three, I think that uh, uh, we all need you know, to have cool heads to deal with the issue even you know, the increasing nationalism in countries in the region. So the leaders and, and, and the people in the region should need uh, to have a cool heads in dealing with those kinds of issues, very complicated, very uh, sentimental you know, issues as well. I think cool heads is probably the most sensible thing for all of us to sort of deal with these issues. You need to deal with it at a multiple number of levels. Firstly, Singapore is not a claimant state, but we are obviously a maritime trading country and freedom of navigation is a critical thing for, the, for us in the region. There are bilateral claims and these have to be resolved bilaterally and that will happen over time. It takes a long, long time to overcome these and to resolve bilateral claims, there will be lots of give and take and I don't expect to see it happen very soon. But that is a process that will continue. In the meantime, what we need to do is to build up a framework where cool heads can prevail. And this is where the code of conduct that we're trying to negotiate with China will become very critical. There's already a start of the process. We need to get into serious discussions, ASEAN and China, to talk about the code of conduct. And the code of conduct is important because it can set out how do you deal with these issues. I cannot prejudge what's going to go into code of conduct, but it, which it should be important that it, it lays out that framework for countries that are concerned about this issue to deal with it. And in this, the U.S. plays a very important role because the U.S. has also made statements when Secretary Kerry was in uh, the EAS last year when he deputized for the president, he spoke about how important freedom of navigation is for the region. Now, it's important that the U.S. keep pressing the region and China to keep talking about these issues rather than to let them slip away because this is where the U.S. plays its role as a resident power to step up to the plate and say these are how we see the things being sorted out. The U.S. has got long experience on this and also U.S. vessels and Chinese vessels have had encounters as well. So you need to work out rules of engagement as well that would prevent any sort of miscalculation on either side. So while we're doing the code of conduct, I think a, a strong U.S spotlight on this is very useful as we talk about it. So to make sure that there is a certain momentum that keeps advancing this, it's not something again that's going to happen overnight. When we did the declaration of conduct, it took us 10 years to get there. And so these are sort of decade-long processes. But I think it's important the region and every, all our ASEAN's dialogue partners keep a focus on this to keep moving it forward. Well, I think uh, the, uh, all this problem on the maritime do domain is related to uh, the fact that the China is rising. And um, they say, China says it's peaceful rise. And the question is that, is that peaceful enough? I think that's the question we need to address. Now, uh, you know, what happened um, in the region on the maritime domain there are two things I want to say. And this is not simply the, uh, the incident and happening uh, over uh, five or four years, even 10 years. It's more than 20 or 30 years, I think, uh, since the time when the uh, American forces withdrew from Vietnam and uh, had also withdrew from Subic Bay in the Philippines and so forth. There was a vacuum of power. We all know it. And so, that was at the time when Chinese military uh, expanded its uh, uh, activities and influence in the regions. And then this was especially ac accentuated uh, since 1990s uh, when China suddenly declared 
the uh, inclusion of all these foreign territory into their lands. And then they send their vessels and f fishing vessels and official vessels, and gradually expanding its own uh, influence and also assertiveness. So this is a long-standing phenomenon. It's not an overnight phenomenon. Number two is that uh, what's happening in South China Sea around Vietnam, Philippines, and those areas are not uh, totally irrelevant to what's happening in East China Sea. I think they, they are more or less the same stuff, I would say, the same phenomenon. And that's consistent with um, Chinese, I would say, maritime policy, expansion, and uh, uh, matching the uh, uh, influence of the United States. We have to look at the realities on what's happening. So for that, I, uh, I want to be candid that uh, we uh, we like to have uh, more, I would say, a um, open and transparent and democratic, I would say, of Chinese foreign policy in the region, especially on this maritime d domain, so that we could have more constructive dialogue. About this code of conduct, I completely agree with you, the uh, two speakers. You know, uh, it is good for us to see all this code of conduct to be uh, realized, not simply by the agreement, by paper. That has to be implemented. That's the whole question. You said that it took 10 years. So it could take another 10 years or 20 years. What would happen during that time? I think we have to be sober about this point. Thank you. Let me open it up to the audience if we have uh, microphone. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Ambassador, yeah, please. I just want to add, add one more point about I see the tensions of the issues uh, on the uh, South China Sea issue, uh, South China Sea, or the East Sea, as we call it, you know, as uh, three uh, categories. First, about the dispute, uh, bilateral dispute between uh, uh, one country to the other, like between Vietnam and China, over the Spratly, other, over the uh, Paracels. It should be solved uh, uh, bilaterally between Vietnam and, and China. But for the issues that involve not only two countries, but uh, uh, others, uh, it should be solved, you know, it, it cannot be solved bilaterally, like, uh, but it should be solved multilaterally. For example, the issue is spreadly, it's not only Vietnam, China, but other uh, partners as well, Philippines and, uh, and, and Malaysia and so on. So it should be solved uh, uh, multilaterally. You cannot solve between Vietnam and China, solve the issue in the spreadly. Uh, but uh, China can solve, cannot solve it uh, bilaterally with the uh, Philippines uh, over the spread list, for example. So we need all the engagement of all countries involved, all claimants. And uh, the third category of issue is that the freedom of navigation, freedom of commerce is not uh, no concern, uh, uh, concerning uh, countries in, in the claimants only, but all countries, including you know, countries like Japan here, uh, including the United States and others. So it should, it's the responsibility of all you know, to get you know, stake, you know, to have a, uh, a voice in there. Excellent points, thank you. All right, we have microphones, if you could identify yourselves and um, I'll try to scan the room so that I'm, I'm fair in asking questions. Um, why don't we go right here in the front? I'm looking for my microphone, folks, okay. Thank you, hi. Uh, my name is Matt Shul. I'm a reporter from Inside U.S. Trade. So I'm going to uh, ask a question about the TPP and follow up on Ambassador Sasai's comments. So specifically, Ambassador, you said you think the TPP needs to be done before Obama's trip in April. Uh, but right now, the main obstacle in the negotiation seems to be a disagreement or a negotiation between the U.S. and Japan over market access. Um, the U.S. has said Japan is not offering enough on agriculture market access. So I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, what is Japan's view of what's going on and, and what do you think needs to happen in order to conclude, uh, you know, that bilateral problem that would allow the, the TPP to conclude uh, by in the timeline that you mentioned? And secondly, to all of the ambassadors, um, do your countries need to see uh, this uh, fast track trade promotion authority legislation passed through Congress 
before your countries would be willing to really put their best offers on the table to conclude the TPP? Thank Good you. question. That was the next question on my list. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, um, why are we stand on this uh, TPP here? You know, um, it's, it's a negotiation. In every negotiation, and there is a phase you come in, negotiate, and try to wrap up. And the, always the difficulties comes in the entry point and the ending point. And I think now we are coming to the ending point. That's why we are facing enormous difficulties. It's obvious, in whatever the negotiation, do you face the difficulties? If there is any difficulty, doesn't mean much. So I think we are coming to that phase now. And looking at the current style of negotiations, I think uh, if you look at the starting point of the, um, the position taken by the United States and, and Japan, it was a big difference. I think we are now narrowing the gap day by day and uh, moving inch by inch fastly. And, uh, and I don't talk much about what we are talking about, but obviously, uh, as, as you know, uh, the market access is a difficult one, uh, both in terms of uh, some of the agriculture products and also automobile. And it's not a one-sided game, you know. Uh, United States is asking for some, uh, some special measures to be applied to the automobile, which is pretty hard for Japanese to swallow all these uh, special, special measures to protect. And Japanese government is, is enormously uh, under uh, pressure uh, because there are obviously some sensitive parts in you know, farmers and we need to maintain some of the minimum way to protect uh, those, those legitimate interests. But the question is not, uh, you know, the uh, black and white. We are now in the process of uh, uh, the uh, final landing zone, I would say. What will be the proper landing zone, which is, uh, you know, um, possible under the uh, current uh, limit of uh, of uh, political acceptabilities, and uh, we there are sensitivities in you know, both parties. You know, we we recognize the sensitive part uh, for the United States, and ja American government also recognizes the sensitive part uh, to us. And um, and this week negotiations uh, unfolding and taking place, and I I, I can't say that uh, how it is difficult and how we are moving. But what I can say is that there is a political will of the both government that we need to settle on this issue. Number two, we are trying to narrow the gap and there are proposals coming forward. And, but both sides are asking for more of the flexibility to find the best ground to land on. So having said it, um, I, um, there is always a uh, you know, difficult moment uh, before uh, coming to terms and to finalize the negotiation. I think we are now in the phase. So from that point of view, I'm basically optimistic. And I, we, we, we have to have uh, more road to go, but uh, if there are a sufficient goodwill and the flexibility of the both party, I think we could overcome the difficulties now. About uh, TPA, definitely we need it. Unless the United States will have it, uh, people might be worried that uh, what would happen if there is a negotiated result and there are lots of uh, proposals and changes and take place, nobody will be seriously uh, negotiating to find a landing zone. So. Uh, we welcome the, uh, the support and passing of this uh, TPA in the Congress as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, I'm in the fortunate position of not being a trade negotiator, so I can take a more strategic view of these things rather than get into, because watching these guys negotiate these agreements is very, very complicated. But I think it's important to remember why the U.S and 11 other countries got into TPP. 
It is to set up an economic architecture for the Asia Pacific, which is very critical, that will help to move the whole region towards a free trade area. There will be toing and froing about what do you give here and what do you give over there. You know, my general approach is that if everyone is a little bit unhappy, I think we have a generally a good agreement. And that we, everyone cannot be entirely happy at everything you get, but that's the nature of negotiating a trade agreement like this. And, but more important, it does anchor the 12 members into this economic architecture of the region. I think that's important to understand. And that's when you come to TPP or TPA, you know, it's really a chicken and egg, which comes first? We've been negotiating the TPP for four years without the TPA on the understanding that there will be a TPA. This is really what I consider US domestic management of the issues. And it will come to that. And what I think everyone looks for is really a bipartisan TPA, the way that the President asked for last night at the State of the Union. Something that pushes forward, that brings together a broad understanding of why it's important to have all these trade agreements. The President mentioned both Asia and Europe last night. TTIP and the TPP coming together and using TPA in order to drive this forward. I think that's where I see the whole framework of things. Rather than one comes before the other, or we need one in order to sort of negotiate. We've been negotiating in good faith for four years without the TPA. <clears throat> I think that uh, recently we have made uh, quite big uh, progress uh, on the recent negotiations in Bali, in Seoul Lake, and in uh, Singapore. And uh, I think at least we have made some uh, breakthroughs in uh, defining the uh, deadlines for most of the domains under the negotiations now. Uh, and given that, and I'm, I'm also very optimistic that TPP can be concluded this year in 2014. And, uh, uh, and for that, I think TP, TPA is very important. I think that uh, TPA if uh, bill, if uh, adopted, it would uh, hopefully lead to an early con conclusion of TPA, uh, TPP. What I hear uh, is that um, uh, all our negotiating partners have to have high credibility that TPA will be passed. And those that are negotiating for the first time, in this case Japan and Vietnam, particularly need <laughs> uh, some early uh, movement on TPA. Um, yes, sir, in the front here. In the middle here, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, Rob Colorina, AIAC Investment. Um, I was curious, uh, Russia was not mentioned, and uh, I was curious as to the mind share that uh, particularly the, uh, the, uh, the ASEAN ambassadors may have towards Russia, um, and I'll leave it at that. I want to see. I want to see okay. the ASEAN way. Yes. We'll go first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that uh, well, we ASEAN we welcome the, uh, uh, Russia's more engagement with uh, with the region. That's why he invited you know uh, Russia to join the AES, the East Asia Summit, you know, together with the United States in 2010 when Vietnam was chair of the ASEAN, and. Uh, uh, and uh, with Vietnam, I think that uh, we enjoyed uh, excellent relationship with Russia as well. So we, we also in support you know, Russia to have a, a more important role uh, in, in the Asia-Pacific region. Just simply, the more Russia wants to do in the region, I think the more they'll be welcome. They are part of the frameworks. We have the East Asia Summit. We have the ARF. The more that they want to do, they'll be welcome to do it. Yeah, I think uh, Russia is becoming a much, much uh, greater partner to the region. I think that's a great thing. We welcome Russia's constructive role, uh, both in, um, in the issues of uh, strategic implication, including how we would cope with North Korean uh, threat in the region. And uh, although uh, some of the leverage uh, over North Korea uh, might be limited to compare to the one China had, but still, I think we welcome uh, Russians' interest in the region. Number two, I think in terms of uh, their economic engagement in the region, including uh, their effort to develop Siberian part, I think that would also 
have a broader implication to the region, not only supplying gas and oil, but also uh, in terms of uh, geopolitical interest and shift of Russia today within Russia and into the Asia Pacific. So if the, uh, the century, this century is the Asia century, we can't exclude Russia to be a part of that process. And I think probably from a US perspective, despite the ups and downs in relations with Moscow, it's been a fairly consistent theme for the four administrations since the Cold War ended that Russia can play a constructive role in Asia and help us all deal with the problems we face. It's right in front of the camera here. Thank you, Dr. Green. Bing Wang with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Uh, my question is to Ambassador Sensaya. Um, first, could you please shed some light on the Japanese foreign minister's visit to the U.S. next month? What is the purpose? And secondly, um, as the Japanese ambassador to the U.S., I'm wondering, do you think Japan and China can solve their problems, the history issues and territorial disputes. Can, US, can Japan and China solve those problems without the U.S. Back, backing Japan up, without the U.S. involvement? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see your face many times. Uh, wherever I go, I see you. You are welcome. That's great. Uh, <laughs> um, now, about the, uh, our foreign minister's uh, visit, uh, is that made public? Not yet, right? Okay. <laughs> but, uh, uh, okay. So, uh, if he would come, right? Uh, I hope he would come. But uh, I think he is, uh, uh, this is a part of the, uh, the you know, uh, uh, the ongoing uh, dialogue between the U.S. government and Japanese government. Uh, and, uh, and the objective is continue to work on, on the, um, the strategic planning in between the two countries, uh, which would include, I would imagine, that uh, how our bilateral collaborations on the security and also the economic, which would include the uh, TPP agenda, obviously, um, need to be addressed. And also, um, what we would do about the region, some of the uh, topics we had addressed uh, in this session will be naturally covered. And, uh, uh, and also some of the uh, international, uh, you know, uh, agenda like uh, Iranian issues in the Middle East peace and others, and all those will be naturally addressed. But I think I want to say this, uh, you know, uh, um, this, uh, the, you know, uh, coming and going is very important in a way uh, to show that uh, we are engaged to each other. So uh, it's nice for, for us to see the American president coming to the regions. As uh, Ashok said, uh, you know, foreign ministers and defense minister coming and, and have a dialogue. That's a part of the process. And uh, uh, if there is, uh, you know, uh, emphasis on Asia Pacific, you have to show up and speak and, and, and get engaged. So. That's exactly the purpose of his business. Now, um, how uh, could he uh, resolve the questions uh, uh, between Japan and China, whether that is a history agenda or a territorial agenda? Uh, is that possible with or without the United States involvement and support? That was your question, right? Yeah. Um, I would say that uh, if I'm asked, could we resolve this question today or tomorrow? The answer is no, possibly. It's been there for some time. And uh, it, will, it will be there for, for some years to come, obviously. And, uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, we can't address the issues and in an in amicable way. Because uh, there was this, uh, you know, problem uh, in the past, and especially the history issues, I would say. And there was a time when uh, both parties uh, recognized the uh, importance of uh, putting this issue in perspective. And uh, not really too much emphasizing uh, the uh, implications of all these issues. 
Uh, but whenever uh, things are getting, uh, you know, uh, ugly, there is a tendency you unilaterally focus on the issues and to make the impression that this is the uh, issues, you know, uh, controlling the entire relationship. And then we are subject to uh, uh, to, um, uh, to very heated debate, and, and that's not good. So the best way for the moment is you just uh, need to calm down and then to restrain uh, some of the uh, agitating remarks uh, from both parties. I think that's the starting point. And, uh, and number two is that uh, this is basically uh, something um, Japan and China need to sit down and discuss. And what the United States can do is uh, facilitate, possibly, not really intervening, per se. And uh, that would complicate the situation, I would say. But, um, you know, uh, when it comes to the sovereignty issues, you, you know uh, the, uh, the uh, relationship uh, the United States and Japan is very solid one. And uh, we never want to see that, uh, that uh, China would misunderstand uh, the, uh, our own position on the issues. It's an uh, illusion that um, the Japan will be threatened and give in to whatever the pressure of when it comes to the sovereignty right. So it doesn't mean that we have to fight a war. I mean, nobody is willing to fight a war, I think. That's, uh, that's not uh, what everybody is hoping for. But you, you look, the, some of the remarks coming out from this and that part are very jingoistic. And I don't think that, that they are the mainstream uh, you know, uh, thinkers, even from China and even on our, on our side. So I think we have to um, label down uh, some of the, uh, I would say, beligalent uh, hostile remarks coming out. And uh, that would include uh, the, some of the uh, spokesmen and so forth. Listening to your comments, um, I think one forecast we can safely make is that these three gentlemen are going to be very busy this year. Um, but the U.S. couldn't have three better friends than Kenny Trosasai, Ashak Mirpuri, and Yen Kuo Kwong. And your country, countries couldn't have better representatives. Um, your comments were excellent, strategic, helpful, candid, without being undiplomatic. Um, I want to um, thank, uh, as we conclude, um, Fred Hyatt and John Bussey for guiding our experts. I want to welcome Rick Rosso. It's great to have you, and you'll be seeing more of him. You can count on that. Um, and thank Nick Sencheni, who um, shepherded this effort, and all of the RAs and interns who are holding microphones today, but in three decades will be Secretaries of State. Thank you all. Thank you. Excellent, Ambassador. Thank you.